Hello, I'm Locke Meredith. I'd like to invite you to join me on my next Legal Lines where we have our United States Senator, David Vitter. Uh, David hadn't been on the show in over a year, couldn't believe it. But we're gonna talk about some very serious issues. Is America safe? Not only within our boundaries, on our borders, but are we as safe from international threats? And do we have uh, a security issue with immigration? And finally, are we safe economically? So join us on the next Legal Lines with our United States Senator, David Vitter, when we discuss those issues. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of myself, Sean Fagan, and Corey Ogeron, and our entire staff for letting us come into your homes for the last 10 years via Legal Lines. We hope that you've come to a greater understanding of how the law works and how the government works for you. So from all of us, thank you. Welcome to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith, and I'm very pleased to have on the show again our United States Senator, David Vitter. David, it's great to hey, see Locke. you again. Hey, Great to be with you again. Thanks I for the invite. I can't believe it's been since February of last year, 2012. Yeah, it has been a long time, but great to be back. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, and, and let's kind of dive in. You sure. know, a lot's happened since yeah. then. When we spoke, you know, the election, yeah. presidential election was coming up. Yeah. You just recently sat through the president's uh, State of the Union. Yeah. Give us your analysis. Well, you know, the election ended up being pretty much a status quo election. Um, Truly. The, the president was reelected, obviously. The House stayed Republican. The Senate stayed Democratic. So you still very much have divided government in Washington and very, very different visions for the future of the country, particularly on the fiscal side. So that continues to be a challenge, particularly deficit and debt. There's no real resolution or compromise there. I hope we get to a sustainable place and start making progress on the deficit and debt picture because if we don't do anything, there's gonna be a big problem eventually. And I, th I think that eventually will be sooner rather than later. I agree, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, what is your view on whether or not we're gonna have, I guess, continued stalemate or head button, uh, or is there gonna be more propensity to compromise based on what you've seen so far? Uh, I think we'll probably muddle through and avoid these big crises or cliffs. I think everybody on both sides of the aisle, wherever you are in the political spectrum, is sort of very tired of government by fiscal crisis Boy, or fiscal is. cliff. Everybody's tired of that. On the other hand, I don't see a big compromise, a big solution coming together. So my guess is that we'll sort of muddle along. And so again, I guess that makes the upcoming elections yeah. in, in 2014 a big, big deal. Explain to the folks why. Well, it'll be a big uh, midterm election. And so the whole House and Senate will be up for grabs. And there's, I'm more focused on the Senate side just because it's where I work, but there's a real opportunity for conservatives and Republicans to make big gains there, maybe take the majority. We would need a net pickup of six seats in the Senate for Republicans to get into the majority, but there are between eight and 10 current Democratic seats that are very competitive. So that's possible. And of course, one of the big races uh, with a lot of national impact will be right here in Louisiana, right. Mary Landrieu's reelection and Congressman Bill Cassidy from this area challenging her as the Republican. And in fact, we've had uh, Congressman Cassidy yeah. on a good number of times. Yeah. Um, what, what is your view um, as it relates to the positions of the parties? Pretty much the same Republicans believe or conservatives believe in very limited government and let the private economy generate jobs and, and pick up the economy versus the Democrats. Yeah, I think you have two pretty fundamentally different views. Uh, I'm concerned as a conservative that we've been drifting and, and recently more than drifting towards sort of a European style entitlement society. And I don't think that's very healthy. And when you look to Europe, there's a lot of evidence yeah. that it's not healthy because it's bogging down those economies, including with deficit and debt. Uh, we need a safety net. We need health and safety regulations. But we also need some place that's vibrant enough to create jobs, to build new businesses, to, to uh, you know, build that economy for our kids' future. And I think we've gone too much toward this entitlement mentality. David, let's, let's talk about it because, um, you know, in, in my head, security is the big issue. We've talked about this in the past yeah. that 
also of as a security concern is the fact that we are weak economically yeah. and, and we are subject to all kinds of economic problems yeah. based on security issues. Well, you know, like you're exactly right, we usually put those two things in different categories. But in a lot of ways, uh, the most important thing for our national security is to have a strong, vibrant economy. When that's happening, we have more ability to take care of our national security needs and not uh, really shortchange ourselves in that regard. Uh, so it goes hand in hand, and to make that point, it's about a year ago that on the Armed Services Committee, we had uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff before us, and one of the senators asked, what is our biggest national security challenge or vulnerability? And his answer was, a deficit and debt. Unbelievable. Yeah. So even that person in uniform, head of the <laughs> Joint Chiefs of Staffs, uh, put that first in terms of security issues because they are so related. David, in fact, I, I think you're stirring a memory that even Secretary of State Clinton indicated exactly the same, that yeah. she's viewing from a Secretary of State standpoint, yeah. that being the number one issue that she was dealing with and just communicating with foreign nations. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of folks acknowledge that. The challenge is doing something about it and coming together around action that will really make a difference. I'm, I'm extraordinarily concerned, and we've discussed this, mm -hmm. but um, the fact that our Federal Reserve continues to pump, as I understand it now, over two trillion more dollars into the yeah. into the money supply, yeah. that that is not only weakening our dollar, but it's causing other countries, Japan, China, yeah. and numerous others, to do the same thing. So we're kind of getting this currency war thing going. Explain why that matters. Well, it does matter, and it's also, I think, building up inflationary pressure. And we don't have inflation now, but when you print that much money, um, it's coming. Now, we constantly ask Ben Bernanke, how is he going to manage that? And he comes to testify before a committee. I serve on the banking committee twice a year. Um, he seems to have this confidence that when that inflationary pressure starts, then he can dial it back. I guess I'm just not as confident that he has this precise instrument at the side of his desk that he can manipulate, you know, as if it's um, a very, very precise scientific instrument. And I'm worried that we're building a lot of inflationary pressure and pressure to devalue the dollar. Well, and what is a, an additional concern is if interest rates start going up, oh, yeah. um, our federal government is borrowing over a trillion dollars oh, yeah. every year. Yeah, then. And if the interest rate starts going up, which I think on, on average over the, the history of this process yeah. is around 6%, 5%, right. we're oh, screwed. Yeah. Then our deficit and debt situation spirals, literally spirals out of control if that starts happening. You know, it reminds me of the situation under Jimmy Carter. Remember those folks who had adjustable oh, yeah. rate mortgages? And so they got a mortgage at a decent rate, but it was adjustable rate. And all of a sudden, because of bad economic policies, the mortgage rate became 16, 18%. Well, in essence, our whole country has an adjustable rate mortgage on our debt. That's right. Problem is, it's not on a couple hundred thousand dollars. It's on trillions of dollars. Seven to, uh, almost 17 trillion. Trillions and trillions of dollars. So when that interest rate starts going up, that's a huge hit to the federal treasury. Every percentage point is on the order of a trillion dollars, and that can really spiral out of control. David, what I was reading too is if you look at the median income of the average United States American family, that if they taxed a hundred percent of it, they would not be able to pay the national debt. Now, now clearly the solution is not on the tax side, and it's pretty obvious to me we're not undertaxed as a society. Uh, I think it's on the spending side, and it in certainly includes uh, mandatory spending, the so-called entitlement programs. Now, I don't like using that term because people have paid into those programs, and it's not simply a giveaway. But that's two-thirds of the budget, and that's a big part of the spending side. We need reforms all around. All right, we'll continue this on the next segment. This is Locke Meredith, Legal Lines, and our United States Senator, David Vitter. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Locke Meredith, 
And I'd like to thank you on behalf of myself, Sean Fagan, and Corey Ogeron, and our entire staff for letting us come into your homes for the last 10 years via legal lines. We hope that you've come to a greater understanding of how the law works and how the government works for you. So from all of us, thank you. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith. Again, very pleased to have back on the show our United States Senator David Vitter. Dave, let's dive right back sure. in and thanks again. Thank you, Locke. We were talking about the huge amounts of money that the Federal Reserve has printed. And from what I understand it, primarily it's gone to through the big banks, the mega banks. And they really haven't increased lending a whole lot. They're, they're kind of putting it in other spots. Right. That's made you concerned that they're too fit too big to fail, that's been a term used a lot. Yeah. What have you done to address that? Well, you know, like in the 2008 crisis, uh, officials in Washington claimed certain institutions were too big to fail and we couldn't allow them to fail. So they got taxpayer bailouts. Now in response to that, legislation that passed through Congress was supposed to solve that problem. So we would never have to do that again. I think it's pretty clear and there's really bipartisan consensus that it hasn't solved that problem, that too big to fail is still alive and well. Probably the most telling uh, measure of that is actually the markets. The markets uh, have decided these banks are not going to be allowed to fail if they get into trouble again. As a result, they actually favor these banks in terms of costs of funds and other things. So there's an actual distortion wow. okay. in the market that favors these too big to fail banks. Bloomberg even tried to quantify it and came up with a figure of about $83 billion a year. I think it's a real problem, number one, because these banks uh, in a future downturn could still impact the whole economy. And number two, if we do the same thing again, the taxpayer will be on the hook again. Paying for it again. Right. So I've teamed up with a Democrat. In fact, he's a liberal Democrat. Uh, uh, Sherrod Brown of Ohio, and we've put together a bill to try to truly end too big to fail by requiring these mega banks to have more capital, to retain more capital so that there is a more of a cushion against economic downturns so they don't get into trouble. And secondly, so that if they do, they won't have to be bailed out by the taxpayer. And we've been working on this idea for a while. We just introduced it last week. And if I read my, what I was reading correctly, mm -hmm. You're requiring basically, I think, $15 of every $100 Correct. they hold in deposits. Correct. And it's for banks who have uh, assets greater than $500 billion. Correct. Exactly. And how, how was that decided? Are those yeah. the big boys? Yeah, those are the big boys. You know, the next bank after that is U.S. Bank at about $350 billion. That's a lot, right. but it's half the size of uh, the next largest bank. So it's basically right now the six largest banks we're talking about and they would have this increased capital requirement again to have more of a cushion for bad times right and if they have to go through that cushion more protection for the taxpayer and and in my head is ringing the term fractional reserve type lending and right. this is really sounds like that's what it's dealing with yeah i think there are a lot of studies and a lot of experts who say there's a great correlation between capital reserves and survivability. And, you know, back in the bad old days before the crisis, some of these banks were leveraged so much that their true capital reserves, when you measure it the proper way, were on the order of three or four percent, not even the eight or nine they try to talk about now. So we're talking about 15 percent. And the reason these big boys were kind of crowding out the, the smaller banks and the local community banks was, I guess, they got access to cheaper money. Yeah, well, one of the problems, again, that these studies have confirmed now, not only is too big to fail alive and well, unfortunately, but because of that, because the market sees that and everybody has decided they're not going to be allowed to fail, they, that actually distorts the market and they get advantages. For instance, cost of funds. Mm -hmm. They'll be able to borrow money at a cheaper rate because, in essence, the market has decided they have an unlimited FDIC insurance plan, for which they don't have to pay anything. Right. They pay for normal FDIC insurance, but they essentially have an unlimited version of it. And, and David, in my head, when I'm hearing that the Federal Reserve is pumping all this money, we're talking about how the markets are really not as assessing risk the way they have in the past. 
Um, I, I'm getting concerned that they're really doing the same thing in the context of just looking at all stocks right now because they figure it, the worse the economic news is, the more money the Fed's going to pump. Well, I, I do think there is a concern that it's distorting the stock market too. You know, everyone wants the stock market to go up and be healthy, sure. um, but that's not the only important metric in terms of economic growth. And I think a lot of these policies you're talking about are really inflating that and distorting that. And you look at other important factors, the most important being employment, and that's very mediocre still. And I've actually heard some economists render opinions or at least surmise that the reason the prices of the stock are increasing is not necessarily that the companies are worth a whole lot more, yeah. but it's because it takes more dollars to buy that same, same share of stock because that dollar bill is worth less. Yeah, well, I'm concerned that that's a factor, particularly when other economic fundamentals like employment are very uh, lukewarm. And, and that's really where I was going next. We have yeah. so many uh, perimeters that the government keeps up with. Yeah. Uh, unemployment still uh, almost 8%. Yeah. Some say it could be 12% if you yeah. add the folks in who just yeah. quit yeah. looking. And, and again, when you really look at who's still looking for work, uh, and when you factor that in, we essentially have Carter area employment. Exactly. Very, very mediocre. We have to do a whole lot better than that. And in fact, mentioning Carter, um, my recall is, is that the formula they used to calculate inflation back then included energy costs, gasoline, gas, et cetera, and food costs, and now we exclude it. Yeah, it has been changed, and, and I think it's been changed to make things look better, to paint a rosier picture. It's also been changed, one thing I'm concerned about, in a way that's uh, particularly unfair to folks on a fixed income like older folks. You know, some of their biggest costs are food costs and energy costs. And when you diminish that as a factor, I think you're really painting an unfair picture, particularly for folks like the elderly on a fixed income. Let's talk about the Social Security programs. And you mentioned a lot of them the folks yeah. pay into. Yeah. But as I'm reading, we've got 10,000 baby boomers retiring a day. Yeah. We have uh, way fewer employees who are actually working supporting yeah. uh, the provision of those benefits. We now have almost, I think it's between eight and nine million fewer people right. working. Right. Um, and I understand that you've put forth uh, 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 an act, a proposed bill that, that would hopefully become law that addresses creating jobs through the energy sector. Explain that to folks. Yeah, well, um, again, energy is vitally important to our Louisiana economy. It's also important to the country. And I think it's a real untapped opportunity for jobs and good economic growth. And if we can do that and create American energy jobs, you can't outsource those to right. India or China, even if you wanted to. You, know, you can't create American energy from over there. So I think it's a real opportunity that can build energy independence that can um, grow good jobs in this country, and it'll even create a lot of new federal revenue to lower deficit and debt, because energy royalty on domestic energy is the biggest source of federal revenue after the federal income tax. So it wouldn't be a, a, a single or even a double, it would be a triple or vir virtually a, a home run. And I think it's a win-win-win. And I think you, uh, you, you've mentioned that uh, not only that, but you're proposing that Louisiana get a larger percentage of the royalties that would be generated from that. Sure. Explain that. Yeah, you know, for 50 years or more, we fought for so-called revenue sharing, for some of the federal revenue on production off our shore to stay in Louisiana to work on things like So we're like working on getting a bigger percentage. All right, let's we're continue this on. as well, sure. Continue this on the next segment. This is Lock Me with Legal Lines. Our United States Senator, David Vitter, will be right back. Hello, I'm Lock Meredith, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of myself, Sean Fagan, and Corey Ogeron, and our entire staff for letting us come into your homes for the last 10 years via Legal Lines. We hope that you've come to a greater understanding of how the law works and how the government works for you. So from all of us, thank you. Welcome back to Legal Lines. Again, I'm Lock Meredith. Again, very pleased to have on the show our United States Senator, David Vitter. David, let's kind of hit what we were sure. talking about right before sure. we, we signed off then. 
Explain to the folks the revenue sharing component of your energy uh, bill. Yeah, you know, like domestic energy is important for the country. It's doubly important for Louisiana because it could produce a really substantial, stable revenue stream. And so we need we, it. <laughs> oh, yeah. We need it for all sorts of reasons, including coastal restoration, fighting the battle here and south in terms of our really survival on the coast. For 50 years, uh, all of us in Louisiana have talked about that. Finally, a few years ago, we passed it into law at the federal level, uh, but it kicks in only in a few years and it's capped. And so we're trying to accelerate how that revenue sharing comes online and then remove the cap or at least increase the cap. That could dramatically increase the benefit to Louisiana. David, what I was reading was indicating that there's four states, Louisiana, Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida maybe, that would share the revenues, maybe not Florida, um, and that we would get almost half the revenues generated. Yeah, I think what you're talking about is the BP revenue okay, okay. through the so-called Restore Act, and that's exactly right. Uh, through the Restore Act, which we passed last year, okay. we take 80% of the so-called Clean Water Act funds from the BP disaster, and we dedicate them to clean Gulf up. cleanup, gotcha. which is appropriate. And you're right, those obviously are the five states that benefit Louisiana the most, simply because we most got hit the most right. by far. And then on, on the, the revenue sharing component for Louisiana, I think we were discussing off the air that yeah. uh, currently it's capped at 500, right. not to get significant revenues, maybe 100 million till uh, 17, but right. your, your bill says let's cap it at a billion right. and then later and the, and the whole delegation, of course, is working together with two broad goals in mind. First of all, accelerate that coming online, and secondly, increase or remove, if possible, the cap. Let's, let's shift gears just a little bit, but sure. it's still related. The EPA, you, yeah. you are now the ranking member for the Republicans in the Senate on the committee, on the right. committee that regulates the EPA. Yeah. So explain it to the folks. Yeah, that just means I'm the top ranking Republican on the committee. If we were to go in the majority, I'd be the chairman. Um, again, relates directly to a lot of challenges we have in Louisiana because one of the primary hurdles to growing our energy sector is overregulation, quite frankly, at the federal level. This EPA has its uh, foot on the neck of the industry, right. uh, in, I think, in an overbearing and unfair way. Now, nobody's arguing we get rid of EPA, we get rid of all regulation. We need health and safety regulations. Everybody's for that. But we have to have some appropriate balance so that industry can prosper and create jobs at the same time. So again, it's a direct impact on a lot of things we do in the state because we are such an energy state. And, and so regulations by the EPA is what is really hurting business, particularly in Louisiana. And, and I understand they're still kind of toying with some form of cap and trade. Where are you on that? Yeah, I'm very opposed to cap and trade and that would really decimate our domestic energy sector. Uh, another thing they're looking at is overregulation of fracking. As you know, fracking is a process that's been around for decades. I think it's fundamentally sound, and it's a process that's very important to getting uh, this new natural gas that we've found in the Haynesville area in northwest Louisiana and other parts of the country. So there are a lot of ways where EPA is really on the march, potentially threatening, limiting, or even shutting down a lot of this energy activity. Explain to the folks that you're, you're on several committees mm -hmm. and you have varying levels of, of roles there. Right. And then likewise, you are part of the leadership for the Republican Party in the Senate. Explain right. how that matters. Yeah, every center is on about roughly four committees, give or take some, and I'm on that number. Uh, by far, my most important role is on the committee you mentioned, Environment and Public Works, and I happen to be the top-ranking Republican there. Um, that's a good committee for Louisiana because it's everything EPA related. And as I said a minute ago, that has a big impact on the energy sector, energy jobs. It's also everything Corps of Engineers related. And of course, we have all sorts of important hurricane flood protection, maritime projects that are directly related to the Corps. It's also everything highway and transportation related. 
and that system is important for our whole national economy, including Louisiana. So it's a good role where I can hopefully uh, do a, a lot of positive things. And I was reading, in fact, you're kind of taking on the, the Corps of Engineers because you found them to be pretty inefficient and they drag stuff out a long time. Yeah, the, the Corps is really a broken bureaucracy, and that's for a lot of reasons, not all of which are their fault. But the bottom line is it's a broken bureaucracy, and we need to fix and streamline that bureaucracy. When the average core project takes 15 to 20 years before a shovel starts hitting the ground, in other words, they study it to death, right. and it's 15 or 20 years before the first shovel's in the ground, that's something's wrong, and we need to do better. That's been a primary focus of mine on this water resources bill that I've been working on with many other members, and that's actually going to the Senate floor next week. And, and one of the issues there for us Louisianans is the Morganza locks and levees, yeah. uh, hurricane response and, yeah. and repairs and such, and so it's great to have you on that committee. Yeah, again, everything the Corps does will be impacted by that committee and that bill. All the work post-Katrina, all the work that remains to be done, like the Morganza system, which is vital protection, particularly for Lafourche and Terrebonne parishes, so a lot to do. The public works component of the committee, um, is that also dealing with our ports and not only transportation? Yeah. Again, a e big deal for everything, us. Everything, ports, waterways, everything on that side, also everything, highways, uh, uh, roadways. So really, all, all that sort of infrastructure you can talk about. And I understand that the, actually we got a lot of stuff that we needed in the last, uh, the bill that was passed. Yeah, uh, the last word of bill was sort of right after Katrina. So a lot of it was a necessary response to Katrina. I had just come to the Senate with sort of a trial by fire, trying right. to drink from a water hose. <laughs> I was sworn in and literally a half a year later, Katrina hits. So it was an interesting initiation to my work there. Uh, and, and, and this bill, we still need a lot of core reform and other measures related to our experience in Louisiana. So hopefully the ne this next word of bill will be productive as well. David, I, I noticed that with the fiscal cliff, we basically raised taxes. I mm -hmm. think you voted against that. Mm -hmm. uh, for the sequestration, you were for that. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have, what, $85 billion in mm -hmm. cuts take place. Right. And then Obamacare is starting to come online, particularly in, in uh, ne next year, January right. 1. Right. And I think you had proposed to try and repeal that. Yeah, um, uh, uh, all of those things are true. On the fiscal cliff, actually taxes, if you remember, were increased automatically under the prior law. That's right. And so once that happened on January 1st, then the question was, were we gonna bring the rates back down for ev anyone including the middle class. So I supported that even though it left upper income earners at the higher rates. Wasn't my first choice, but uh, the rates went up automatically, so we had to fool with that. That was a significant tax yes. increase, $620 billion, a major tax increase. And that's why I'm sort of frustrated like most conservatives are when the president talks as if that didn't happen, that, that we need more tax increases but it was and is very reluctant on the spending cut side. David, thank you so much. Thanks, Locke. Appreciate Enjoyed it. to visit as always. Thank you so much. This is Locke Mayor of Legal Lines, our United States Senator, David Vitter. Thank you for being with us.